Today's episode of the Nick Taylor Horror Show is brought to you by Diabolic DVD. For almost 20 years, Diabolic DVD has been the source for horror, cult, and weird cinema to customers around the world. Diabolic offers a one-stop shopping experience for all of your favorite labels, including Arrow, Synapse, Vinegar Syndrome, Severin, Mondo Macabro, Blue Underground, 88, and many more from all corners of the globe. So whether you're looking for the definitive version of Suspiria or trying to upgrade your crusty old DVD of Cannibal Holocaust, Diabolic is the owner-operated small business choice you've been craving. Shop online at DiabolicDVD.com. That's D-I-A-B-O-L-I-K DVD.com. We're also brought to you by Deadly Grounds Coffee. It's the number one choice of horror fans worldwide. Nothing starts your day or night better than a delicious cup of Deadly Grounds. Whether you're hunting ghosts or fighting the next zombie apocalypse, any one of Deadly's 30-plus roasts will bring you to caffeine nirvana with the richest flavor you've ever had. Whether you're craving their hellhound roast, witch's brew, devil's night roast, or sinful delight, Order online at getdeadly.com for easy and safe shipping right to your door. We know that once you go deadly, you won't go back. Join the deadly revolution today. Be bold, be different, be deadly. Deadly Grounds Coffee. Coffee to die for and zombie approved. Get some at getdeadly.com. Welcome back to the Nick Taylor Horror Show. David Pryor is an American writer and director who made his feature directorial debut with The Empty Man. The Empty Man is an epic in the world of horror, and definitely one of the most criminally overlooked horror movies of 2020. The movie itself has the scope, ambition, and execution of a Chris Nolan movie, while mixing elements of cults, quantum horror, and creepypastas into an extremely unique mythology that is all its own. Guys, if you haven't seen it, you really have to. Empty Man was one of the most ambitious horror movies of recent years. The story behind the making of Empty Man is very harrowing. In the middle of shooting in South Africa, the movie was temporarily shut down due to weather conditions, during which a key studio executive who greenlit the movie left the studio, essentially leaving the movie abandoned. If that wasn't enough, once the movie finally got finished, David had to endure a series of calamities, including negative test screenings and studio interference, which kept the movie in limbo for years. If all that wasn't enough, once the movie was finally released, it was in theaters during the height of the pandemic while Fox was in the middle of a Disney acquisition, only to get largely negative Rotten Tomato reviews, which were very unjust, and be completely buried in obscurity. However, as of the past few weeks, The Empty Man has been seeing a major resurgence as a number of outspoken critics have been singing the praises of the movie and thus causing it to finally get the attention it deserves. The story behind The Empty Man brings to light the many issues that can befall a movie, but also shows the power of the internet to champion a movie when it belongs in the spotlight. I'm personally thrilled that Empty Man is getting the viewership that it has been. It is a must-see, and I'm convinced it'll be considered a horror epic for years to come. In this conversation with David, we get into the whole story behind Empty Man, his directorial processes, and what he learned from observing directors like David Fincher, Tim Burton, and Peter Weir when he visited them on set while producing special features for multiple DVD titles. All of this and so much more on today's episode of the Nick Taylor Horror Show. Now, without further ado, here is Empty Man director David Pryor. David Pryor, great to see you. How's it going? Very well. You too. Thank you so much. It's a it's a real pleasure to be able to talk about the movie. It is my pleasure, and uh, and seeing the movie was uh, a real a real unexpected treat. I mean, I started reading just some of the resurgence articles that that seem to recently come up. I mean, after what happened to the movie happened, and you know, we'll definitely touch on that. But a lot of people. <laughs> just wanted to champion and champion this movie and make sure that it got the recognition that uh, 
that it deserved. And I just think that that is, I like positive elements of internet culture because there's not a lot of them yeah. these days. There's and not a lot. Yeah. This is like the opposite yeah. of toxic fandom. You know, what, the, what, yeah, what, yeah. what happened with, yeah. uh, with your movie, which I think was fantastic. How, what is the, and I feel like it just happened like a week ago. I mean, what, what is the past it's, couple of weeks well, been like? Yeah. It's so it's, it's been a very, uh, it's you couldn't possibly have predicted that this would happen. I mean, I, I didn't even. I guess I'd always hoped. Once I knew, once I knew the 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 way that it was going to be released. I mean, because there was a long time there where we weren't even sure it was going to be released. So apart from the fact that the the initial studio was not high on the movie, um, because the way that studios work is almost antithetical to. <laughs> to um, making anything um, unusual or, or that dares to break some of the kinds of bounds and expectations that people have from certain genres of movie. So without the kind of deep investment that can come from a, uh, you know, a personality at the studio who has been championing the thing, which we right. had originally and, and then lost partway through, we were kind of adrift for a long time and then um, and then throw in a corporate merger and all of the, you know, the, let alone the COVID aspect of it. There was a, there was a long time where we were kind of in limbo and weren't sure what was going to happen. And then I started hearing rumors that we had been given a release date and the date kept shifting and changing for reasons that sometimes and often didn't make any sense. Um, so every time I was given a date, the date would come and get close and close. And I'm like, wait a minute, if it's really coming out in April, shouldn't we be gearing up and like, it's, it's already, you know, it's already March. Like what's right. going on. So by the time the final October date happened and again, nothing was going on, I wasn't hearing anything. And then suddenly a trailer and a poster drop. Hmm. I was like, there's, you know, we're, we're kind of sunk, but, um, but the hope always was once the thing is out there, maybe, maybe somebody will start to see some value in it. And then the rotten tomatoes of it all and all that stuff. So, but it wasn't until it got out on digital and there were a couple of people um, who were talking about it online early on, like mm -hmm. even back in October, November, but nobody could go, nobody could see it at the time. So I think it required that D VOD release right. to finally, so that people could access it. And then I can't, I can't overestimate the impact that Chris Stuckman has had. Um, there were people that got in earlier, um, and thank God for them. And they started to kind of word out and that, and frankly, it's those people that got Stuckman to watch it, but I didn't even really know who Chris Stuckman was, but as soon as he came out and said something positive about it, it seemed like it started percolating, hmm. you know, I don't know if he has his finger on the algorithms of YouTube or something like that, but right. for whatever reason, People, people seem to really care. So that's, I think, the surge you saw within the last week was, at least as far as I can tell, was partially at least attributable to that. And um, but yeah, there's just been this wonderful kind of renaissance. The thing that you know, this this movie, I, I told somebody else that it had been so long, and there was so much. I mean, I, you know, I stuck. It was hard getting the movie as it is through the system. Mm -hmm. It wasn't easy. It would have been very easy to acquiesce and allow a truncated 90 minute version of the thing. But I just always knew that if I, if this thing, if I stand a chance of surviving this, it's going to be presenting the movie as close to how I wanted it to be and letting the chips fall where they may rather than compromising and maybe getting more of the studio resources behind the marketing, but having a movie that doesn't represent what I want to, yeah. what I want to make. And um, so those are the dice you roll, you know? Um, yeah. And thankfully, there has been this really amazing sort of resurgence of turnaround. And I, I, it's like you said, it's a positive aspect of, of Internet culture. And and it's in a way, it's kind of the better outcome, because mm -hmm. when people have, when marketing is shoveling something at you. It's not, you know, anybody's passion. I mean, people can obviously passionately love something under whatever circumstances, yeah. but I know I know that the people who like the movie and are championing the movie are doing it for no reason other than they feel really strongly about it. And that's, that's really gratifying. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, I mean, as far as the movie itself, just five minutes in, I was just blown away at how people weren't talking about it 
prior and how it didn't have a huge, you know, huge splash because it is like the inception of horror. You know, I mean, Chris <laughs> Nolan's inception, you know, um, it's it's that. so <laughs> just spellbinding and, and fantastic and fascinating. And for horror fans, it is it's a, like a magnum opus. Um, I know it was a very, very harrowing journey just to get it made and not to mention what happened with the studio merger. Could you walk us yeah. through, and I know this is a big story, so feel free to give us as abridged or as, you know, long winded sure. version of the story as possible. But I feel like there's so many big lessons in here for filmmakers and working with studio systems and, you know, perseverance and endurance and things like that. But this was a hard movie to get made. Could you walk yeah. us through the, um, just the overall process from the, mm. from the very beginning to how, how the, the movie finally was able to get done? Yeah. Well, okay. So the, uh, the broad strokes of the beginning, I mean, no, nobody, nobody ever does anything, um, alone. I mean, that's the, the, the plus and the minus of filmmaking is as an, as a film artist is that you're not, um, working solely on your own devices, like mm -hmm. a novelist or, you know, painter or somebody else You have other people. So particularly when you're dealing with something as, as treacherous as the studio system, it's, you need, so I basically I'm saying I didn't do it alone. Yeah. Um, you, you know, uh, Ross Ritchie and Stephen Christie from Boom uh, Studios sent me the comic book. Uh, it's, Ross and I had been talking. He'd sent me several things over the years, and we, you know, we liked what I liked what he was doing, and he liked what I'd been doing, and we were trying to find something to do. And this thing came along, and it was more about the spirit of it that um, that intrigued me. The actual narrative of the thing felt really well suited to a comic book, but uh -huh. I didn't have a way in as a movie. I couldn't figure out how to, uh -huh. how to crack it in a way that felt like it was cinematically um, getting at what I thought was the juice of the idea. Right. So, but it happened to be very um, um, simpatico with a lot of the stuff that I'd been working. For example, the opening sequence is almost entirely except for a couple of tweaks is a short story that I wrote like 15 years ago. Oh, wow. Um, and in fact, the whole concept of if you touch me, you'll die is from a different story that I'd written 15 years before that. So mm -hmm. I was trying to find ways to um, take some of the ideas that I'd been wrestling with and sort of graft them into this thing, um, create sort of a merger between, between myself and Cullen Bunn and where those concerns kind of cross together. Yeah. And, um, <clears throat> so, so once I had a general approach, um, just the, the framework of the story, you know, who the main character was, the subjectivity of the thing, choosing a single um, protagonist to kind of experience the story through, and the general broad strokes of the thing, um, I went to them and I pitched it. And I, I've said it before, but I said, you know, the, the word perfect faithful adaptation of this comic book is if that's something you're interested in, then, you know, no harm, no foul. But if you're interested in letting me kind of play with it, here's what I would do. And they really responded well to it. And so then we took it to Mark at Fox and he responded well. And then we did a little bit of development. Um, I wrote the script really quickly. Um, did a couple of rounds of notes, one of which was making the prologue longer, actually. Mm. And I was, the uh, Our executive was the one who pushed me to expand it a little bit. And oh, I was wow. like, are you sure? Because this is a conversation that's going to come up later. It's already on the, you know, long for a cold open side. Mm -hmm. um, I don't want to be in a situation where I, we've gone ahead and done this and then ha be told I have to cut it in half because I'm, it's, it's not going to, if I do this the way that you're talking about doing it, it's going to be a tightly knitted fabric that yeah. needs to work this way. There's no easy way to just chop it out. And he was like, no, 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 we love this. And, and we were talking about for the sequels, each one of them will open it with this kind of big Ooh, operatic, nice. you know cold open I love back the when there was actually a chance of a sequel. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> so that all happened relatively quickly. Um, the writing was really, really pretty easy. And then, um, you know, they say that people, there, there's this phrase in Hollywood that uh, your movie has been greenlit. Mm -hmm. And in my experience, there's really no such thing as a green light. All there is is just an absence of red lights. So... <laughs> The system starts to move and gather up a little bit of momentum. And as long as nobody with the, about, uh, the ability to say stop says stop, 
then you're then you're greenlit. I mean, I knew we were greenlit once we were rolling. Mm-hmm. So it was kind of a curious um, uh, revelation about how that process actually works. Um, but at the time, everybody was on board, the marketing department, the publicity department. I had to do, I walked into this, meet, you know, I was told to come to the studio and have this meeting with some of the executives. And I walked into this, you know, 70 foot long conference room with 40 people around this huge table. And I was like, <laughs> okay. And wow. they said, so tell us your movie. I was like, wait a minute, I wasn't prepared for this. So you just wow. have to, there's a, there's a lot of, um, you know, you have to learn how to bullshit your way through stuff like that a little bit. Yeah. You need a little bravado and, uh, and thinking on your feet. Yeah. Yeah, I just got to, okay, well, here's what we're doing. Um, and um, so then we, you know, the the physical production people sent us to Cape Town um, to scout it because financially it would make a lot of sense to shoot there. You know, I was saying that I needed 55 days to shoot the movie. Um, and they said, you know, if I if I could have done it in 30 days, we maybe could have shot it in Los Angeles. But there was no way to get the... So way to do the movie in 30 days. It was ridiculous. Yeah. I mean, 55 was, was cutting it pretty short anyway. Um, and I just knew they were saying, you know, if you don't like Cape Town, let us know. It's fine. We'll, we'll look at Canada. We'll look at some other places. But looking at the, at the financials and like what the exchange rate was for the dollar to the rand and what the mm. rebates were and all that, I was like, they really want me to pick Cape Town. And if I come back and say no, they'll say, okay, fine. And then we'll look at Canada and the money won't necessarily make, it'll just protract the thing. Yeah. I knew if I could figure out a way to make, to make Cape Town work, it would keep the train on the tracks. Mm-hmm. Um, and so we did, you know, it's like, and you know, it's, it was a blessing and a curse. There was a lot of things about Cape Town that were wonderful. We were able to build huge, you know, a lot of the movie was built on stages in Cape Town, even stuff that you might not realize was a set. Um, but trying to match middle America Right. on the streets of, of you know, French hook is uh, not easy. So we did, we did end up doing a couple of days in Chicago, but essentially that's how it all came together. It was actually fairly rapid as far as these things go. Um, we went a, about a year, I think from the time that we initially made the deal to the time that we, we were in prep. Whoa. Wow. Something and this like is that. a pretty yeah. outlandish concept for a huge studio like Fox to take under their wing. It's a, it feels like a big gamble because it clearly was, was very healthily budgeted and it's, it's outland. The, the not subject really, ma- no, not really. <laughs> no, no. I mean, I think our total budget was probably what they paid catering on Deadpool too. But, um, <laughs> um, I heard the food know, was that good was on Deadpool benefit. too. Yeah, it was really good. <laughs> um, no, the, the benefit of the thing to them was as far as I understand it. And I, you know, I hope I'm not, you know, I just don't want to be wrong about things. But what I think was happening at the time was that they were looking around at the kinds of movies that other studios were making in the kind of genre uh-huh. um, movies and realizing they didn't have anything like that. And they wanted something in that yeah. space. They had a deal with Boom Studios who has all of this IP. And the whole IP of the industry right now is kind of the, or the concept of IP being itself into itself valuable, even if it's not a property that people are aware of, Mm -hmm. is an interesting, interesting look into the uh, mind of the studio executive. But Mm. it was an advantage here. They had this IP, they already owned it. um, And it was sort of in the space they were looking for. And they liked this, uh, the take on it. So and it didn't cost much. I mean, that was the benefit to them was really budget was no, the budget was um, we were about about 16, 15 or 16 million net. Oh, wow. I would have thought a yeah. lot more. Yeah. Cause it, it has well, a huge good. look to it and it's just, it's- that, thank you. That was, that was the challenge. It was like, how do we take these small, I mean, if you're going to make a movie with that kind of in that budget range, you're it's, it's much smarter to limit the locations in the cast, but we were in mm-hmm. a situation where we had, we were trying to do something with the sense of scope and a breadth and a kind of, you know, a little miniature epic in a way. And right. um, so, you know, that's where Cape Town came in very handy. That makes sense. We would not have been able to pull that off in Toronto. Yeah. You know? Well, were there any keys to making it feel higher budgeted than it was? Because the production value is just, it's off the charts. I, I'm shocked that it was only $16 million to make. But were there any <laughs> kind of... Because I mean, the movie just it moves at at a very deliberate pace, and it feels like you you were not cutting any corners when it came to getting the right shots and getting the right lenses and getting the right lighting. Just everything feels so 
exquisitely orchestrated oh, in this from a cinema perspective. How were you able to do that on, on a, on such a comparatively low budget? <laughs> uh, well, I think, uh, casting your, your key departments, um, was a big part of it. I, yeah. um, you know, my DP, um, Anastas did a fantastic job. Um, very happy with his work and, and, you know, I was talking to a lot of DPs, but he's the only one who came in with a with a lookbook that, you know, because after we'd had several, we'd had a couple of initial conversations, he knew photographically the kind of things that I was looking for, the mm -hmm. sort of um, generally, you know, low key, um, single source, soft backlight and that kind of thing. Um, and so he put together a little presentation of the kinds of images he thought I might be talking about. And we had talked about still photographers that I liked and stuff. And so he he just got it mm -hmm. and did a wonderful job. And I, but I also think that production designers often don't get enough credit because it's almost like a, it's people think a movie look, that looks good, they go to the DP. Right. And sometimes, sometimes that's fair. I mean, I think certainly if it looks good, the DP had a lot to do with it. Absolutely. I mean, I'm not saying anything else, but there's only so much a DP can do if what he's lighting isn't very interesting right. or not very well thought out. And so, um, so the production designer, Craig uh, Lathrop, who I got from um, his work on The Witch. Oh, okay. It was such an exquisitely designed movie. All in natural and light. All natural light, uh, except for one or, you know, the interiors. But um, but the way that that set was put together and the, and the budget that he had to work with, it was, um, you know, stunning bit of work. Yeah. And he was brimming with ideas and, and did a wonderful job and, you know, so between those two guys, I mean, when, when the movies are made in prep, that's, that's a kind of an axiom that um, if you don't know it now, learn it because it's absolutely true. Scout, 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 scout. I mean, tech scouts, a lot of tech scouts. And the clearer you can be with your people who have to then go and implement your ideas about here's where we're going to be. Here's for how long we're on, we have this, we have that, we don't need this. So don't build that, you know, that kind of stuff. Yep. If you're able to be really clear about it and repeat it, drum it, drum it into people's heads, because just going on a single tech scout and telling them the ideas often isn't enough. Mm -hmm. You have to go back and you have to do it again. So there was a lot of that. There was a lot of tech scouting and a lot of um, conversations. And we had 13 weeks of prep. It was supposed to be 12, um, but badge had a scheduling thing. So it bought us an extra week, which mm -hmm. was great. Um, and just being decisive. I mean, I think that's really the only, you know, you can't just walk onto a set and not, I say that now, of course I did this, but you know, generally speaking, it's a bad idea to walk onto a set and not have a very clear idea of what you're trying to accomplish and know yeah. when you got it and get out. Um, but that's how, that's the only way I know how to do it. And that's, I think as responsible for anything for being able to, you know, it's the old saying, it's like, how do you eat a whale is one bite at a time. Right, right. So, Makes sense. That's what it was. So the movie had wrapped in, I want to say 2016, 2017? Well, yeah. So we, we shot until, we shot in Cape Town until December, and then we got two feet of snow in Chicago when we okay. showed up there to patch in the exteriors and kind of do the Americana aspect of it. Right. Um, so... There's a valley, there's a lesson here too. Um, I had a very strong, we, for one thing, we hadn't, we didn't have enough prep time in Chicago. Um, we went from Cape town straight to O'Hare. Okay. And we had like maybe two days or something to get set. And we hadn't been able, we'd been so far away. We hadn't really been able to properly prep Chicago. Plus the weather was just, it was it was correct for how I'd always wanted the movie to look, but mm -hmm. it was never going to match what we'd got in Cape Town because we were in their springtime in, in December, right? That's the, the nuisance of the equator. Um, <laughs> so, so when we got there, I was like, this isn't going to work. It's not going to match. We need to, we need to put a pin in this and come back in April. And the studio said, no, keep going. Uh, I said, we've got a weather report that says 60% chance of snow tomorrow. And they were like, just keep going. Our, Costumes were caught in customs in Cape Town. Oof. So our Chicago wardrobe people were working 24 hours around the clock overnight trying to match these costumes that we couldn't get out of the airport. Yikes. Um, and then we got two feet of snow. And so I said, we're done, right? And they said, okay, fine. God, I guess we're done. I should have said, no, we're, we're still shooting. 
I should have just kept going because you guys had the opportunity to to listen to reason about this. And you, you know, there's a lot to, and they're not completely wrong either. I mean, there's there, the other side of it is that once a train is moving, it's dangerous to stop it. Yeah. Because it can always it can always never get back up again. Mm -hmm. But it just felt like to me for the good of the film, we needed to really be delaying it. Um, so you shut down out, production. Snow, at this most point. of this, we shut down. Most of the snow melted. It turns out, which was depressing to find out. But um, so yeah, we shut down, and then we went back to LA and started editing, and you know, filling in gaps with storyboards and previs and things like that. Um, and then our executive got let, you know left the studio. So, and this was a key executive for the project. He was championing the movie yeah it turns out you really need those in a studio <laughs> environment <laughs> movies can just wither and die if yeah. they don't have that one person on the inside who's pushing it forward um which is a very strange thing if you really think about it because it's still their investment right it's, but it's weird how we just yeah we, we just got orphaned it was very peculiar um so uh i was forced <laughs> Um, it was it was insisted uh, to me that I show a the current cut of the movie to the top brass. Okay. And the current the current cut of the movie with all of the you know unfinished as it was with all of the previs and everything was still it was like two hours and forty five minutes. We had just cut it down from three hours. Like, okay. like the first cut was was something like three hours. So I'd been making all of these wholesale cuts trying to get it down to shape, but then they said they wanted a screening and. Um, what I learned from that is the executives that you're there to sh that are assist insisting on this aren't going to show up if it's two hours and 45 minutes long. Mm. They're just not going to come. So they'll send juniors who then report back to them on what they've seen. And what I should have done is said, I would love to show the movie to you guys. I can't wait to show the movie to you guys. Once we're finished shooting, we're not finished shooting, but here's my best 40 minutes. Mm. Okay. That that would have been very advantageous. I should have done that. Um, but in any in any case, um, we finally got another executive um, who came in to kind of you know tidy up the uh, situation and finally let us go back and finish shooting late that summer, and that was it. So there was a there was a protracted several months shutdown between yeah. the initial shoot and the wrapping up. Mm. And it sounds like that harmed the film's momentum in a way. It did and it didn't. You know, on, on, on another hand, on the other hand, we got our costumes out of Hawk. We got the weather that matched. Um, as long as you're able to actually go back and finish, a shutdown isn't necessarily a bad thing. And sometimes it. it's a it's a benefit because you've had a chance to really live with what you do have and and maybe tailor what you're going after. Yeah. Um, we were able to get, a, I, I can't remember anything specific, but I'm sure that the pickup shooting was affected by the time that we've been able to spend alone with the, what we had. So gotcha. it's not necessarily a bad thing. Okay. So the movie's wrapped. And at what point does the trouble really start? <laughs> well, the trouble starts when, again, so the test screenings phase. So um, editing in particular, in my experience requires a lot of stepping away from it, thinking about other things, um, you know, just kind of letting it percolate a little bit so that the soil gets, gets wet because it's so um, it's such a big job cutting a movie. And then you it, trying to kind of keep it all in focus at the same time, you know, you're working on it in little bits and pieces. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you get those things really dialed in. You get scenes that you think really work. And then you look at it in the hole and you go, oh, well, that that's clearly that scene can't stay here. Yeah. So there goes four weeks of work that you threw into that thing. And that level of of examination and introspection and, and you know, percolation was not allowed to happen before we were forced to test screen. So we got back from Chicago and we had to rush right into a test screening. I, I, I don't remember how long we had, not long, maybe a week or two. And again, it was still a work in progress. It was still very long. And I've told the story about what happened at the test screening before, but essentially, you know, we got this, the, the feeling in the room was good, but the scores were terrible and mm -hmm. we never had another screening. The, uh, 
the we just it was like that the judgment had been passed yeah and that changes it's amazing how how much importance people put on things like a single test screening in Long Beach where a bunch of teenagers didn't get the movie. Right. And it's, it's not that they, it's not that the ones, the ones who didn't get it really didn't get it, but there were, we had a few people who totally dug it, mm-hmm. but those voices were not the majority. So we were kind of, um, it's like our fate had been sealed by that one screening. That's wrong. Um, yeah. It's just the way it's, and it's why I don't, I've never trusted that screening process. I like this. I, I love screening work prints for audiences. I love feeling the backs of their heads. I love right. the, that's very educational. You can feel the room out and there's something that it's, it's almost a kind of quantum mechanical phenomenon. But when you are working alone with, with a movie or, or with your small team, it's a very different thing than when you take it and put it up in front of a bunch of strangers. Yeah. It's absolutely clarifying. You can have a something that you were not entirely sure, like, I don't know if this really works yet or not, or if this scene's just a little too long or whatever. And just the act of putting it up in front of strangers goes, clarifies. Like, oh, you go, oh, no, no, no. This is this is too long. We got to go back. Or we got to, this doesn't work. Or we got to switch these two places. Yeah. And it's like you've observed the cat and suddenly the quantum possibilities have collapsed and you, you kind of know what you have to do. I don't need... I don't need a bunch of junior college students telling me where, what the ending ought to be. Yeah. You know, what the fuck is up that's with that? the part of it. That's the part of it. I don't trust. Yeah. But the act of the screening itself is a very, very valuable thing. Gotcha. So I want to geek out a little bit. There's, um, there's a really, uh, there's a fantastic scene in the movie that I think a lot of people are talking about the cult scene. Where, um, where it's one of the most terror, like iconically terrifying scenes I think I've seen it in it in quite a long time. Could we Thank do you. like a little anatomy of the scene? Could you talk about where the idea came from? Kind of some details as to how you shot it, sure. the mood that you were going sure. for, because it is it it's it's very alarming and it's very effective and uh, <laughs> it's it's awesome. It was a real highlight for oh, me. Oh, bless you. Bless you. Thank you. Um, uh, it was. Um, it's funny how, you know, I, to some extent, I see the way that I could, that it could have been, but mm. I'm glad that it works as well as it, as people seem to think it does. Um, so uh, the idea for it, I think I can't, I can't remember exactly. Uh, all I knew, like, all I knew is I wanted a kind of a, a de- certain amount of kind of visual rhyming to go to be going on through the movie to kind of train you into thinking of, it's like everything in the movie is trying to tell you there's two ways to think about this mm. and so that's why it was so important to me to have certain point of view shots where if i'm going to have a point of view that's kind of raking three quarter to the right i also need the opposing left and or the way that the bridge kind of splits into two it was just mm-hmm. a little um bit of filigree that i thought was important and so that's this the group of cultists was a reflection of the scene outside the cabin okay with ruthie and the kind of you know childlike um game of you step back i step forward mm. that kind of thing. um the visual of it that i'm i saw a video of a bunch of sufi dancers there's you know what a, the sufis mm-hmm. are they're a kind of a sect an islamic sect yeah that gets into these ecstatic states by, uh, by spinning, right? But um, there's a video of a, like, I can't even guess, 200 of them, maybe? Wow. In this concentric circle, in this huge space, all moving in absolute unison at speed, like whipping around, all rising and falling at exactly the same time in this kind of hypnotic sort of spiral, this human spiral. It's one of the most amazing things I'd ever seen. And I was like that, if we can get that, um, this will really be something. And unfortunately there aren't very many Sufis in Cape Town. So we (laughs) we weren't able to, we weren't able to quite get that sensation. But, um, so we ended up, so we shot it in, uh, in South Africa, most of it. So there was a park that we found during the location scout. There was all kinds of cool things there. They had these little narrow wooden bridges that I thought were cool. And they had these little islets out in some, I was on a floodplain. So it was dry when we scouted it, but I was guaranteed that it would be flooded by the time we uh, got back. 
or at least it was there was a little bit of water there, but not mm-hmm. not very much. But in order to get the people all running across the water, we had to build a bridge underneath it. Another bridge. So we built a built a steel structure underneath the water, so they had something to run across. And the gag for me was like, you think you're safe because yeah, they're menacing and they're strange, but at least they're over on the other side of this body of water. So. Mm-hmm. There's only so much danger I can really be in. And then to see them just run right through the water was kind of the, that was the uh, idea there. Um, we shot that in a little area of forest that had just hosted the Dark Tower when we were there. there some of their set pieces were still lingering around in the woods. We had to shoot around. Oh, or I guess by the time we shot, they were gone. But yeah. uh, when we were scouting, they were there. Um and uh, yeah, you know, we just had a, st- a crazy stunt team and a whole bunch of extras, and uh, and then we ended up having to shoot Badge's side of things uh, in Illinois, underneath the actual Chain of Rocks Bridge that night when we were there. So all the stuff, ninety percent of the stuff on Badge when he's looking at them and reacting and looking up at the stars and that whole thing was all shot in Illinois. The rest of it, his points of view, were all in Cape Town. Okay, interesting. So one thing, uh, uh, another kind of geek question with a movie like this, there's so many elements to it. There's so many seemingly influences. What was your cinema diet like when you were developing and approaching and making the movie? Were you, were, were there any films that you were consciously watching to kind of seep them into your consciousness or to, to research? Um, that's it. Yeah. It's curious. I, on one hand, I try not to overly stimulate myself with other people's work when I'm trying to, uh, develop something, mm. but on one hand, I mean, I, movies are just kind of coming out of my pores. So I've already, I've always got influences kind of popping up. And then there are times when I wanted to be reminded of something, the way that somebody had done something. And so, yeah, I was, I was watching a lot of stuff. Um, the, if you watch Angel Heart and you look at the way that he uses inserts, Mm. way that Alan Parker will sometimes traverse an entire, like he'll, he'll get a character from A to B just with four insert shots rather than actually traveling them across a space and the kind of economy of that. And, Mm. and the way that it creates a kind of, um, uh, a tempo, you know, when you, when you're able to kind of breeze past things by doing it that way. Um, there's God, there's tons of things. I was, I'm always watching tons of Hitchcock movies. I'm always, uh, you know, all the usual things. <laughs> yeah, there he is. <laughs> um, and sometimes the influences are, are, are I, I hesitate to uh, point any out specifically because I think it's more fun if people pick up on them. I'm not a big fan of overtly homaging. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It feels a little masturbatory. Mm, yeah. Um, I told somebody else, like one that I'm ashamed of, and I'm glad that it, you can't really see in the movie, was we were having to decide on the number outside the ICU that Paul was in in the hospital, what room number. And in the heat of everything, as we were talking about it, I was like, should we make it 237? Oh, no. <laughs> like, and I kind of went, okay, let's make it 237. And by the time we got to shooting, the prop had been built, and I already kind of felt bad about it, so I just didn't really feature it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it just it's a little bit it's gimmicky and i think that if you're trying to create a sense of um your own space it takes it could take you out of the movie i think ultimately that's what it is i like a good in joke you know like there's nothing wrong with putting ope in, in graffiti on the wall because you're a mm-hmm. strange love fan or um, you know, certainly the opening shot of the movie has certain antecedents that are pretty clear if you yeah. look at them. Um, but generally speaking, I try not to, to do that too overtly um, gotcha. because I'm more interested in figuring out what my instinctive things are. Now, of course, my instincts are polluted by other people's movies because I've grown up watching them. Mm-hmm. But um, that's the way it goes. <laughs> <laughs> I heard you say something interesting in a previous interview about an audience's tolerance for ambiguity. And there's yeah. elements of this movie that are ambiguous and or can yeah. be considered up for interpretation. And I, I feel like it's such a fine line between kind of leaving the audience with, uh, 
you know, sort of cinematic blue balls and wanting things explained, <laughs> but yeah. also if you over explain and you overindulge in exposition and you, you, you tie everything up with a bow, it also does lack like a mystery. And I thought that this movie really had, had a fantastic sense of mystery to it. And I did like oh, not you. knowing, and I liked not understanding everything. And I'm just curious as to what was your approach to, to the, the, it, the dance with ambiguity when it came to making the movie and the mythology behind it and all of that. Well, I, I know that I enjoy that kind of thing. Um, I, for one thing, I think that the themes of the movie without getting too pretentious about it. I mean, I think in the most, in its most obvious base level, the themes deal with the question about what truth is and mm-hmm. do we live in a, what are the ha- what are the hazards of fostering a culture that that is no longer quite so sure of itself, or that mm-hmm. is that is that leaves the idea of objective truth open to interpretation? Like whenever I hear people say, "I'm telling my truth," I wonder if they really know what the implications of that are. Mm-hmm. Um, and so that, by its very nature, requires a kind of. I mean, if the story is about ambiguity then it kind of has to be treated in some way ambiguously, or at least, you know, allow for the room for room for that. So I, the only degree to which I intentionally pursued that was um, trying to get ahead of where the, what the possible interpretations were of the ending. I mean, I knew Mm. that sense of the sense of a, of a held breath and not exhaling is how I wanted the ending of the movie to feel. Yep. Um, But I knew that getting there, if I did it right, there were there were at least two, and I found I think three ways to read the events of the back third of it. And the goal was to try to support or provide some support for each of those three interpret- interpretations, imagining the hopeful possibility that people might be, you know, sitting around a Starbucks after seeing the movie, and and each with a different idea about what happened and each able to point to some way in which the movie um, didn't make them wrong. Right. Right. Um, so the trick with ambiguity is that you run the risk of not, of being unsatisfied. Mm-hmm. And so that's why we knew going in, like some of the conversations we were all having at the very beginning was um, this is not a four quadrant movie. It's going, some people are going to hate it. Uh-huh. And we have to be prepared for that. Like, hopefully enough people love it, but we have to be ready for the fact that we're going to be confusing people. Some people just don't like to be to be unsettled that way. Right. And I think some of it comes from media training. They've been trained mm. by certain kinds of, you know, they look at movies as, as you know, implements to digest mm. and ex- and then excrete and move on to the next thing. And we were trying to aim for something a little more difficult than that. Um, and that, you know, the bigger the, the bigger the mouthful, the harder it is to go down. And so right. we, were, we, were, we knew kind of what we were walking into. But I kept thinking about Mulholland Drive and how the experience, my experience watching that the first time I was alone at a theater in L.A. And I, I had no idea what the hell had just happened, but I knew I didn't want it to end. Yeah. There was just a there was such a feeling about it. It's an atmospheric thing. It's like, um, and I knew that there was stuff there to figure out, but the experience of watching it was on such a different level than figuring out the exposition that, um, you know, to me, when you, when, and when you boil that movie down to its obvious plot, once you really look at it and, and follow it, it's dead plain what's going on. Oh, yeah. And it would, and it would be so boring if you told it that way it would just be the soap opera version of the story. Right. And, but instead it's got this kind of refracted kind of dreamlike quality that, that gets back where the story is getting bounced back and forth between the interior of the main character and the exterior of the story. And that's the feeling I was trying to go for, at least a place where the story and the, and the main character are kind of in lockstep. So the world dissolves along at the same time as the main character's psychology is dissolving. And, Anytime you do that, and anybody who had come up and said, you're setting yourself up for failure, audiences are, are going to reject this, I would have said, you're right. That's probably true. 
<laughs> but I still want to do it. It's the cost so. of admission for doing an ambitious movie. You're not everybody's going to get yeah. it. Not everybody's going to like it. Some people don't want to think. They don't want films that challenge them. And it's just the reality of a lot of moviegoers, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I don't recommend it okay. <laughs> as a first time out. As a, as a, as a first time out. I say that advisedly, knowing that anybody who could be dissuaded by my saying that won't is would never have done it in the first place. But, yeah, you know, cool. Well, I mean, as far as the movie, I mean, I can't sing its praises high enough. It's extremely enjoyable, also just beautifully done, and it's extremely ambitious too. And there, it's, in terms of just cinema, it is it's spellbinding and fantastic, and I'm a really big fan yeah. of it. So in terms of your career history, you were in a very interesting and fortunate position to be able to observe a lot of major directors at work. I mean, you you were close to David Fincher. Uh, I believe you were able to observe Tim Burton on set and a number of other directors. Could you talk about what those time periods were like and um, and, and, and what you were how how that experience prepared you to direct a movie of uh, with this level of ambition? Well, what it. Yeah. So all of that work was uh, fodder for, you know, all kinds of things. It was also a distraction. I mean, I, the, the, the thing when you, when you're broke and you find a way to make a little bit of money, um, you know, that there's a chance that you're going to end up on a different trajectory than the one that you'd set out for yourself. And so I, I'll, most of what I, I remember from that extended period was be careful because you're going to, take your eye, you know, don't take your eye off the ball. The ball was always making movies. Yeah. I remember telling my mother when I was, or she tells me that when I was five, I told her that I wanted to direct movies because I'd asked her who, who made Jaws. And she said the director. So I was like, that's what I want to do. And so when you're whatever, whatever bizarre thing that is that tells a five-year-old with such clarity what they want, it's like every day that you're not doing it is a kind of a curse. But, um, you know, there was, I, I, we, you know, anyway, without getting into too much personal history, I ended up in a situation where I could champion and champion this movie that Fox was doing something very similar to. It was a kind of ambitious and strange, interesting genre movie called Ravenous. Mm-hmm. And they did not get the movie. They didn't, they didn't particularly, they certainly didn't understand it. And I don't, I didn't get the impression that they liked it much either. And so they just dumped it out and I was intrigued by it and happened to know some people in home video at the time and convinced them to let me go do a special edition to try to draw some attention to it. And it ended up working. And that led to fight club, which is I wanted to meet Fincher and, and that led to planet of the apes and a bunch of other things. And so I was there in a situation going, okay, well, I'm not, I'm obviously not, in a state place yet to be working, making my own stuff, but at least I get to hang around and talk to Peter Weir. I mean, and David Cronenberg, you know, it's like, this was, and it was in in a sense, it was the blessing of it was I was doing it because I was there to support their work. It wasn't like I hadn't asked for their time. I wasn't impressing myself upon them. It was just in the, in the course of trying to be a, a support function for their, for their work. Yeah. I got to, I got to be a fly on a lot of really interesting walls. Yeah. And, and it's one thing that a lot of directors don't get, which is the ability to really watch other people do it. When you, there was one team on, on the social network when Terrence Malick came to visit and Whoa. it was, it was really exciting for me because, you know, days of heaven was such a huge, a huge monumental thing for me when I was growing up. Um, and to find, you know, I mean, apart from the chance to kind of sit and chit chat with Terrence Malick, it was the thing that I heard him and Fincher talking about was that Malick, you know, it's like most, you never walk, you never get to watch other directors work. It doesn't really, so all the, all directors really know is how they do it. Mm-hmm. And it's, so it was interesting all those years to, to be in the position of seeing how all of these other guys do it and comparing, but I'll tell you the most valuable thing uh, that it, gave me was I, I not aesthetically so much because I already kind of knew aesthetically the kind of way I like to work, but it, it showed me wh- where the power bases really are mm-hmm. and how directors of a certain caliber manipulate the system and bend it to their will. And the kinds of things that you can expect, you know, what's reasonable to expect and what's not reasonable to expect, like the, the system of it mm. 
was very instructive talking to executives the way that like i was never early 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 before i ever started doing this I, i'd written a couple of things for hire and and had a couple of meetings with producers and stuff and, and you have, you know you deal with a little bit of that stage fright and having to being a little intimidated and that's done I, I, that stuff was gone after this experience after watching the way that the kinds of conversations that actually go on at the upper echelons is like yeah. so that kind of de the demystification of it and it was was extremely valuable and I, I think maybe the most valuable although you know watching how peter weir copes as a performance was in, in unbelievably um educational wow were there what any a smart interesting guy yeah were there any specific instances or you know anecdotes or, or lessons that really came in handy when you were making empty man hmm. i i'm trying to uh i'd love to figure out a specific way to answer that you know that in a way that was kind of insightful and witty i i, I can't think of anything but i think it's because all of that stuff just kind of gets absorbed. Right. And uh, the answer is obviously. Yeah. But I, but it was, but it happened unconsciously. And I, so I can't, I can't specifically put my finger on one, but if, if one occurs to me, I'll, uh, I'll circle back. <laughs> okay. Gotcha. <laughs> so when it came to empty man, obviously there were a lot of, uh, there were a lot of roadblocks and difficulties. Was there any kind of fundamental dark night of the soul for you? And if so, how were you able to push through it? And cause I feel like the more directors I speak to, the more they all say that filmmaking is a game of endurance. So what was able to help push you through these really difficult hurdles? Heavy, heavy drug use. Uh, no, I, I <laughs> that's what I was hoping you'd say. <laughs> Lots of booze. Um, <laughs> Cape Town has a really great wine district, I'll tell you. Oh, um, hey. I, I don't think a night went by. And you can't get it in America for some reason. There's very few exporting uh, companies that deal with South African wine. Yeah, you don't everybody see a lot of South African there. wine. Yeah, everybody who it. shoots there really misses it. But, um, hmm. uh, you know, every night's a dark night of the soul if you have a certain mindset. Um, the... I think there's some... like there's not a lot of time for ruminating when you're, when you're in production, mm -hmm. because even if you have 55 days, um, you still, it's, it is about endurance and, and that's because the hours are unbelievably long and any chance, any 20 minutes you can take to yourself is a prize. Yeah. And if you're doing the work, right during the day, you don't have time to go to your trailer and decompress. I didn't have a trailer. You know, it's like there was, I was never off the set because yeah. that's just not, you know, unless you're shooting for 200 some odd days and you've got a setup that's going to take three hours and you've already caught up on everything. I can't imagine being in that circumstance. So, so by the time you get to the end of the day and you get back to your apartment or hotel or whatever you're staying in, it's like sleep. Is really all you can think about yeah. sleep or a bottle, a bottle of wine, some sleep, and maybe a phone call or two. So there's the, so the good thing is it keeps you from being too um, introspective, hmm. but later, you know, when you're, I try not to let stuff get to me that much. I mean, things do inevitably, but when you're, when, when you end up the being in limbo was the hardest part of it. Yeah. Having made this movie that I was proud of and the, a lot of other people had put in enormous amounts of effort in and whose work I was also proud of and who deserved better than what we were getting. Um, the uncertainty of all of that was, was pretty depressing. Uh, and then of course, you know, you absorb all of that negativity, uh -huh. which is, which you can't do. It's not yeah. good for you, but you kind of do anyway. And so by the time I actually got to go see the movie in October, where I, I had to buy a ticket in, in, uh, Orange County to go see it. Um, I walked out with this kind of fresh feeling because I was like, oh, it, you know, I'd almost been half convinced that it was worthless because that's the way the studio had been treating it. And that was like all that, that horrible test screening, all that stuff. Yeah. And I walked out of it going like, oh, it's not worthless. Like, that's actually pretty good. That's like, yeah. I, there's things I wish I could have done differently and stuff like that. But it's for the most part, I'll stand behind that. I'm proud of it. So that was a relief. And that means I'd probably been going through nine months of dark nights of the soul up until that point. <laughs> it and just the, creeps up on you, I bet. 
Yeah, yeah, exactly. So it was, uh, anyway. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think you touched on something that's a common problem with a lot of directors is being in a state of limbo, whether they're in production hell or development hell or whatever kind of hell. Um, it's easy to just get stuck. It, it, any keys or pieces of advice for transcending limbo for being able to, because I mean, the studios are going to be the studios, but is there any any keys for, for getting unstuck and getting out of limbo? Well, ideally, you want to be able to move on to something else. Um, the, oh. the best, the given that, you know, people that work at a certain level, obviously directors that have achieved far more than I have and have a, are in a position of um, um, being able to be the custodians of their own destiny a little more, um, aren't necessarily beholden to the same. I mean, everybody deals with bullshit. There's yeah. no, there is no director that's ever lived, uh, no matter how powerful, that hasn't had to deal with bullshit. But yeah. you hopefully are dealing with a higher quality of bullshit. I think Guillermo del Toro said, every time you make a movie, it's eating a shit sandwich, but the more movies you make, they give you a little bit more bread. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a good a good way to assess it. Um, and you also at least can get to a point where you know that what you're doing is going to be released. Right. right? I mean, when you're dealing with not even knowing if it's going to be released, that's that's a scary kind of place to be. Yeah. Um, and the only way I know of to get through that is, um, I mean, the way I got through it is to write. I was just trying to write other things. And yeah. It's not easy. Um, I mean, writing is not easy anyway, but particularly figuring out how to, how to, uh, you know, cloister your thoughts so that you're not getting so overwhelmed by the, it, it's weird. You know, there's something about being an artist in a, in a, I, I even, I feel shitty saying the word artist. I mean, it's not, I don't, but I, I hate, I hate how it might sound, but to be a film artist in a, in a, in a business that is not oriented toward the best of what's best for film artists mm -hmm. is on some level, you have to care about it more than anything else to all distractions. You have to, it has to be the most important thing to you. And you also have to be the one person in the room who's willing to walk away. And wow. the only power, the only real power that a filmmaker has is the willingness to go. All right. sounds like you guys have this all figured out. You don't need me for it. If you and if and it's hard because you've also at the same time have to care about it as much as you care about a, a you know, I mean, a child is an easy and obvious metaphor, but obviously I don't care about my movies as much as I care about my children. But in the same kind yeah. of you have to have possession of it, you have to you have to own it in a personal way and be willing to abandon it. And if you if you can figure out how to navigate that contradiction, then you'll be in a much better position to have more bread with your shit sandwich. <laughs> I feel like that's an enormous piece of advice. And I feel like it's indicative of just how Hollywood works, you know? Yeah. You yeah, need to, the, yeah. the paradox of this. Yeah. I, I definitely a lot to digest there. So last few questions. Um, when it comes to a movie like this, there's, there's so many, as we were talking about before, there's a lot of elements to it. There's a lot of details. There's a lot of, you know, separate mythologies that all kind of come together. I'm curious about two things. What is your process like for collecting what uh, what David Lynch would refer to as firewood? He he has these files where he he pulls like it's maybe it's an image from a magazine and maybe there's a piece of music, maybe there's a few photographs. It's things that he kind of keeps around him as he's writing that help stimulate mm -hmm. you know ideas. So I'm curious how you collect firewood and how do you collect just ideas that come to you? Because I'm sure as you're driving, you'll have like a disparate image of something that might make sense in a movie somewhere that might not be a project that you're you're currently developing, but you want to save somewhere. So how do you how do you save the firewood and how do you save the actual ideas that you, you later put into your screenplays and movies? Yeah, the it's a very important um, thing that I have been I've been remiss about. I, I have notes everywhere, um, and it's it's not a kind of systematized process um, nearly to the extent that it ought to be, given how important it is. I have there I have must I must have four different notes apps on my phone, uh -huh. plus two or three different audio recording apps, so that when you're either too sleepy to write something down or driving or something you can dictate. Um, the, and I've got handwritten notebooks. I've got books where I do drawings and or I'll clip pictures and 
paste them and then paint around them and and all of that stuff the problem with it isn't doing it i mean to, training yourself to to write them down and not tr not trick yourself into thinking that idea is so powerful i'm never going to forget it like mm -hmm. you'll forget it oh yeah you got to write it down but um and i've forgotten stuff that i felt really strongly about and it kills me <laughs> because i know i'm never going to get it back i know that feeling but, but the problem is is how to go back and remember that it's there when you need it because all of those audio files are just a date and a time, like a timestamp and a right. running time, unless you actually take the time to go and label it. And then even if you do label it, how do you remember to go? So I've got to figure out a way to get it all kind of in one spot. Yeah. Do, do it, be a better, a better systems management man about it. Cause it's too disparate right now. Do you ever and use so Evernote? A lot of times I'll, yeah, I use Evernote. I use a couple of different ones and um, Evernote went, I, I don't think I paid for the Evernote version. So I still get the ads and stuff, but anyway, there is Evernote's, uh, Evernote's is good an example of what it, I should just take all of the other crap and put it into that one. And then it would, and then it, I would know where it was, but organizational skills is really the fundamental because yeah. having an idea is great. Writing it down is critical, but being able to find it again is the other really important thing that I haven't gotten a complete handle on yet. But I, as far as like the firewood, you know, it's like when there's a piece of music or, a, or an image, I'll, I've got lots of screen grabs on my, on my devices that I, you know, that sit in apps and occasionally I'll try to figure out a folder to put them in. So yeah. I know if I'm working on something specific, I'll go hunting and, and find things that resonate in some kind of way. And I'll put playlists together of music to use, particularly when I'm writing. That's where I found lust Mord, by the way, was the, uh, the, you know, the, most of the music was written by Christopher Young, but the, um, we used a little bit of lust Mord for, um, a kind of atmospheric effect that he does that nobody, it's like, it just sounds so unusual. What oh, he wow. does. And I, that's, that's what I was listening to when I wrote the script. Oh, that's and, cool. and I was able to on the, we were down in Cape town and we were getting ready to shoot the, um, the uh, assault at the top of the bridge where Ruthie kills everybody and falls over. And um, I was able to play her and Aaron, the music that was going to be in the scene. And, you always run the risk of doing that and having to change, go, well, sorry, it's not, it didn't work out that way, but no, it's exactly the music that I played for them that day is what's in that scene. Oh, wow. So it got, got them in the, gave them some firewood, I hope. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so really that's, cool. that's basically it. Gotcha. Well, David, this was, this was a real pleasure and a whole bunch of fun and huge congratulations on the movie. I'm so glad it's getting the recognition it deserves and uh, yeah, real pleasure, man. Thank you. Oh, Nick, my absolute pleasure. Thank you so much. And uh, it, look, if there's anything else that you need or, you know, you, you're listening to it later and there's something you forgot, I'm happy to jump back in with you. But I appreciate this, was, it. Uh, this, this was a lot of fun. Thank you. Any uh, parting wisdom for those aspiring filmmakers out there? Uh, go make movies. Um, I was telling somebody else asked me to what the only advice that anybody ever could give. And when I was a kid, you know, going out to make a movie was unbelievably expensive film is film was not cheap and yeah. uh, I couldn't afford it. We were shooting video, but nowadays with phones and everything, there's, there's no excuse not to just go do it. And, um, you know, I think the only, uh, as far as, except for practical advice, like there was a whiteboard session. I was getting ready to go do another movie before that never happened. And I was, I had the enormous pleasure of having David Fincher sit me down in front of a whiteboard and, and, map out a methodology for how to approach shooting stuff within a schedule Whoa. that was enormously, uh, I mean, I was half out, half in and out of my body. Like the part <laughs> of me is trying to really pay attention to what he's saying. And the other half is like, this is so awesome. Um, but, <laughs> but so there's a lot of practical advice about how to, um, navigate that kind of the production process, but really outside of that, I think the only thing that any, that, really matters is the work so yeah. um just go go make a movie great on that note <laughs> david thank you again thank you man take care you too all right here as always are some key takeaways from this conversation with david Pryor. number one movies are made in prep when you watch Empty Man and observe all of the locations decisions camera angles and story elements 
It's a comprehensive and extremely ambitious epic of a movie, but its budget was actually comparatively low. The key to accomplishing all that David was able to on such a mid-range budget was all about preparation. David stressed each and every detail related to locations, productions, blocking, scheduling, and set details to an obsessive degree, and he made sure it was all communicated to his production crew. So much of your time in production is spent in communication and dealing with the consequences of miscommunication. If you can alleviate this by being incredibly well prepared, you can set yourself up to be way ahead of the game. This will alleviate your time, energy, and focus substantially so you can get the right shots the right way and seriously boost your film's production value because you've handled all of the minutia upstream. The idea of prep sounds like a little detail, but it can make or break your movie. Roger Corman has also been very outspoken on this topic as well. Number two, there are no green lights. Given his experience on Empty Man, David is someone who can attest to the many difficulties that can befall a production, particularly one from a major studio. David learned that as a director, at no point is your movie ever really guaranteed. Even if your movie has been approved, even if it's been funded, even if it's been edited, you're never really safe. And therefore, you can never really let your guard down. I'm paraphrasing here, but Guillermo del Toro once stated that the natural state of a film is for it not to happen. And Rob Zombie calls every finished film a miracle because a completed production defies the odds because movie making is chaos and the studios are ruthless. It's hard enough to get a movie approved and funded by a studio. But at that point, the battle is far from over, unfortunately. Movies get canceled all the time, sometimes halfway through filming. It is a cutthroat business. And as a filmmaker, you need the kind of iron will that can push through that. Hollywood is a magical place, but it is littered with broken dreams and an infinite amount of unrealized projects. And the unfortunate thing is that it's a system that doesn't care anything about you, your script, or your hopes and dreams. I'm not trying to sound pessimistic. In fact, it's just the opposite. In order to have the kind of iron will necessary, you need to realize that Hollywood is the land of Murphy's Law. And if you can go with the flow of it and not get too disheartened or take any of these things personally or give up on the dream, who knows? You may just make it. Which brings me to my next point. Number three, be ready to die for your movie, but also be ready to abandon it. David touched on something that I think is really fascinating and potentially very groundbreaking in terms of the mindset of a director. We've established how tough a place Hollywood is, and when it comes to being successful as a filmmaker, there's a serious need for endurance and a serious need for a never-give-up attitude. Yes, directors essentially need to be goonies because goonies never say die, but you also need to have the fortitude to be able to walk away. When making Empty Man, David came across enough pushback from the studios where he was ready to throw his hands up and walk away from the project, despite putting years of his life into it. Luckily, the project still came to be, but the fact that he was willing to walk away raised the stakes in the eyes of the producers and helped build enough urgency to push the project forward. This concept is an absolute paradox and something only to be considered as a last resort, but sometimes... The willingness to abandon a project is exactly what's needed to move forward, either with that project or with your career in general. The willingness to walk can create a major shift in the power dynamic, especially with a studio head. But of course, it can backfire, especially if you're bluffing. So tread carefully, but do think about this. Anyway, guys, thank you as always for listening. If you enjoyed this episode, why not share it with your friends and family on social media? Don't forget to follow the show on Instagram at I'm Nick Taylor. That's I am Nick Taylor. And on Twitter at the same handle. Thanks again for listening to the Nick Taylor Horror Show.